Uh, so, uh, as I was telling Samantha, I'm an historian uh, by schooling. Uh, I'm not a historian now, but um, there's some disciplines about his history that I like. I like data. I like asking questions. So, um, by this thing, um, put your hand up if you're running production workloads in Kubernetes. Okay, almost almost about half of you. Keep them up. Keep them up. Okay, so, oh, uh, put your hand down, put your hands down if the, the percentage of your workloads are less than 20%. Okay, uh, less than 40%. Wow, there we go, less than 60%. Okay, these guys are on the, uh, on the edge of it. So, um, probably less than 60% or so. I've got 80, up to 100%. Okay, great. So again, same exercise, put your hands up if you're running the production workloads in Kubernetes. This one's a time-bound one. So put your hands down if you reach product production stability in one to three months. Wow, that's impressive. Okay, uh, three to six months. Oh yeah, <laughs> his hands back up. <laughs> there we go, six to nine months. Good. Uh, let's see, somewhere nine to 12 months. And we're gonna keep going. 12 to 15 maybe, anything greater than that. Okay, great. Um, 18 months or greater. These questions will be relevant as we get there, um, as we come up a little bit later. Hey, Xander. Good. So, how familiar are you with console? This one uh, is just kind of a, um, a range of values. If your answer is what's console, if you don't know what console is, raise your hand. Cool. All right. Hey, I like that. We got some newbies here. You've heard of console. Who's heard of it? All right. Awesome. Uh, let's see. You've played around with it, maybe in you know production, maybe not. Uh, let's see, what else is going on here? You're running it in production, console in production. All right, a couple folks here, awesome. You're a console wizard. No. <laughs> That's a hard thing to be. Okay, great. Does anybody know who this is? What's that? Oh, you don't know? Oh, I thought that was the answer to it. Um, so this is Elizabeth Jake Feinler. Uh, what she did is that um, she ran the NIC for ARPANET um, back in kind of the early days of the internet. Um, she was a civilian. She ran, uh, she ran this uh, division. And they created the first name registry for the internet. So the kind of precursor to DNS at the time. And at the time, everything was updated by hand. So if you changed IP addresses of your system, you'd call up Jake and say, look, you know, I switched my IP address. You need to change this record. They go in there. They change these things. Or maybe you send a snail mail or whatever it was that you did. And the reason she was called Jake is because her sister couldn't say Betty Jo. Um, she could just say ba uh, uh, Betty, uh, Baby Jake, and uh, that's how the name stuck, and that was her name, nickname for the rest of her life. Actually, she's still, she's still living. So, hi, welcome to Scale, 18X, thanks for coming out. I'm Jake Lundberg. Um, I'm a regional manager for solutions engineering at HashiCorp. Um, that's a fancy way of saying that I help sell software. Um, if the regional manager part of this sounds weird to you, um, don't worry. I spent probably the last um, 20 years or so um, doing operations and support and all kinds of things in and around Linux and um, sort of Unix operations. So uh, I've been with HashiCorp for a couple years now, and uh, I was promoted to manager about six months ago. Um, uh, unfortunately, again, Sean Carolyn couldn't make it here to give this talk, um, so I'm here giving it. Again, I, I live in Redondo Beach, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm local here. So Sean is, uh, originally was going to talk about easy service discovery and hybrid environments with console. Um, I kind of cross this out because my talk is slightly different. I call it service networking for everybody. Okay? Interestingly enough, the talks are almost exactly the same. I just changed the title so uh, I could have my own flair, and that's the way that it goes. Okay. So service networking, uh, a brief history. Um, for those of you, again, I'm a historian, so um, hope, bear with me as I go through why um, console actually exists. So this is a service. It's just an orange box on a white page. That's great. What does a service do? It's just some kind of code that you have out there in the internet, um, or possibly in your local systems, that does some kind of a function, right? Um, the, the, the bare you know, sort of uh, function of what it is that we create are these little units of code that we then deploy out um, into our ecosystems. So let's talk about a service that maybe some of us care about, payroll. Right, so we're just going to give it a name. It's a payroll function. You get to it um, to talk about paying and all the rest of that stuff. So where does a payroll service run? And you know, up until the modern day and internet systems, most everything ran um, on some kind of a server system somewhere, right? So I've got a piece of code. I'm going to run it on my laptop. I'm going to run it on the internet. I'm going to run it on a set of servers that are inside of this um, thing. And these, uh, and these servers have some kind of a address to get to, right? So if I'm a person that needs to get to the payroll, 
I'm going to go through some amount of routers that are out there and, uh, and do that thing. Hey, what's up, Eric? So how do I get to that thing? Um, the, the first and probably easiest way that you can do things is just look this thing up by its IP address directly. It said 4.2.4.2.1.2.3.4. I can connect to that thing. Maybe probably not through a browser in these days, but I'm using a browser here. But what happens when I update that IP address? What do I have to do? If I'm typing in an IP address in this window, fail, I can't get to my application anymore, I've got to figure out some way of getting to that. And that's back to where Jake Feinler and her crew comes in, is they, they came up with this concept of a name service that allows you to map some kind of a name to an IP address. And this is a very simple sort of DNS record, A record, that says, okay, now I'm going to map payroll to this 4.2.4.3 address. And now I just give, you know, whatever um, system that I'm calling on a name, and I connect to this thing through this IP address and this port that's on here. So what happens if this thing changes? Well, we call up Jake, and she goes into the system and updates the A record for this thing, or C name, or however they're going to do this, and maps this thing to a new IP address. There's a very manual process um, for DNS changes that were happening um, up until some of the new technologies came around. Okay, so again, uh, my user gets to do the payroll, they connect, they're happy, give the green thumbs up. Okay, <laughs> now what happens? What is this? Anybody know what this is? It's a hacker, of course. How do you know it? Because they've got a hoodie on, they've got a laptop. Clearly, this is a nefarious person trying to do bad things in your environment, and maybe they're going to play global thermal nuclear war, and then you're going to blow up the entire world um, when, the, uh, when the AI sort of wakes up and figures out that humans are going to you know, kill each other with coronavirus anyways, right? Um, so anyways, uh, you've got, you got this guy, game over, man. Uh, so anyways, uh, the way that we got around this idea of insecurities within our networks is that we created this concept called a firewall, a combination of networking devices and ACLs and all kinds of blacklists and whitelists and all the rest of that that happened. And so now I've taken my application, I've stuck it inside this firewall, and anybody who touches this thing burns to a crisp and then, you know, and then they don't get inside of your network. The problem is then, when I'm a user outside of that network, I've got to get to this particular thing, and how do I do that? I, get, I try to get to the payroll, I want to get paid, that's great, uh, and I can't do it because the, the firewall says I'm not allowed to do that. And so then, the administrator goes out there, they allow my address, they, they know what my sort of home address is here, they put this into here, and they allow me to connect to this particular system. And so now, I have connectivity, and I get the thumbs up when I go to um, this payroll device. Okay, so what happens now if I have to add in three people, or ten people, or a thousand people? Every single endpoint that wants to talk to this particular application in this firewall wor um, world is going to have to have some kind of a rule set. And again, for the vast majority of firewall operations, this thing is controlled by a, by a spreadsheet, or it's controlled by some human somewhere that's tracking all the endpoints that are allowed to actually talk to each other. So what's the next problem that we run into? We've, we've solved the security problem. Now everybody wants to get paid. You just, you know, it's like HashiCorp. We went from like two people to 900 people in a couple years. And so now everybody's connecting to the system. They want to get paid, these greedy people. And, uh, and so what happens? Like now I try to connect to the system and I probably get denied just because of the fact that there's too many people actually connecting to this thing. And so how do we overcome this particular problem that we have? Well, maybe we add in a bunch of more servers, right? So now I just take that particular service and I run it on a bunch of different servers, but how do I get to this thing if I'm a user trying to get to um, these particular endpoints? If I say payroll, now I've got three possibilities of something that I can have out there. And the concept that we use is, is, is called a load balancer. And so there's hardware devices. You could actually do DNS load balancing as well if you want to. That was kind of the earlier versions of load balancing. Um, it had um, some problems when we started scaling these things out. But the concept, of course, is that I'm going to create something called a virtual IP, and that's what I'm going to map that name to. And then on the back side of that thing, I'm going to add a bunch of you know, hosts that basically um, you know, serve data um, to these particular endpoints. And then again, as I add these systems into the network or add them into here, um, now when I you know, so, sort of select this payroll device, I go through this virtual IP, and the load balancer then divvies out my connections to any of the, um, of the hosts in the back end, right? So it allows us to scale these things out um, and get um, a much wider um, sort of um, connectivity to these, um, to these systems that are busy. All right, so this is a monolith, and we're going to move into a slightly different concept here. 
So the payroll service is made up of a bunch of different things. Um, I had to ask my mom about this. I'm not an accountant, but uh, apparently there's like this thing called gross wages, yuck. Um, there's taxes, bigger yuck. Uh, and then there's benefits, which yay, we like benefits, okay. Uh, but in, in, in theory, your, 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 um, your payroll is broken up into these different services. And traditionally, they all kind of ran in one machine, you know, Java machine or, you know, whatever C++ machine or something that you have there. Um, but now we've gotten into this discipline of actually splitting things out for a variety of different reasons, for better or for worse, actually, depending on who you ask, in the microservices world. But this trend is, is really starting to take off, where people are then decomposing their applications into these smaller units, and then typically running them um, in separate areas um, on your systems, right? And so now um, I, have this, I have this thing, I want to go to payroll slash taxes, and then I'm probably going to have like some kind of a URL um, that sort of defines which part of the payroll system that I want to connect to. And so how do I get to this thing, right? Now do I have to like, if I have this name that sort of has this slash on here, DNS systems don't really have a great way of like delineating sort of subspaces within host names. It's just a host name. It's just, a, it's just, an, it's just an IP address that routes you to that particular endpoint. And now I've got to split this thing off in this like little namespace um, deal that, that's here. And the way that we solved this was that we um, added in some proxy um, technologies. So um, I was an, uh, an Apache HDB um, administrator for a while, uh, moved to Nginx over time. Both of these technologies are there. We've, uh, we've since got things like HA proxy and, and so on and so forth, right? So the idea is like my basic payroll um, endpoint, I put a payroll and a slash. The proxy is then going to um, know where to send that data based off from the layer seven data um, that is, uh, is defined there. Oops, I lost my timer. Okay, so then when I want to get, to get the taxes, because everybody loves taxes, um, you just put the taxes at the end and the proxy then um, does some regex understanding and then ships that stuff to the proper end. Um, who here is really good at regular expressions? Yeah, two people. You guys are amazing. Uh, you, uh, we're, we're hiring, by the way, so, you know, I mean, like, come get my card after we get here. <laughs> Does anybody know who this is? It's Gordon Moore. Okay, I, I'll let you off the hook. Does anybody know what Gordon Moore um, gave us? Moore's Law, exactly. So Moore's Law at the time said that the amount of sort of, um, you know, transistors or any other kind of components that we would um, put on side of a computer chip is going to double within a year. Um, later, I think that extended to two years. But the concept is now we have this um, sort of this explosion of the capability of the systems that we've created, our compute systems, about being able to actually do um, all of their computing. By the way, he was a co-founder of Intel. This guy's super rich right now. Good for Gordon. All right, so one of the problems that comes about when you do this, though, is the fact that now I have this, like, you know, these, these computer systems that are getting stronger and faster and, and more memory and more disk, and I've got these, you know, payroll devices that are spread out about, you know, these different devices. What's, what's your uh, take on what's happening here with this uh, performance of these systems? They're highly underutilized. Right? And so, you know, I come from a systems admin background. My concept is I'm paying for all of this hardware. I want to utilize that stuff. You know what I mean? Like 10% utilization is bad. 90% may be kind of bad. Depends on what kind of applications you have. But you kind of want to, it, you want to um, pack as much information as you can on these systems to, to really maximize the cost that you have. And so what do we do? We started taking, you know, more applications and we started putting them on these servers. And so now I've got, you know, my payroll on here. I've got the general ledger. I'm running Salesforce. Hopefully you're not running like SharePoint or something like that because then you could just, then you could just totally utilize your systems properly. CMDB system, something along those lines, right? And so what do we do? We came up with this concept of a hypervisor, and the hypervisor allowed us to do what? This is to basically pack a bunch more computers into one computer system. And so the, the age of virtualization and sort of the rise of a company like VMware um, catapulted into sort of the next generation of computing. Now I can utilize these hardware resources and I can create a bunch of sort of isolated systems and run my applications in a slightly more isolated way. That way I'm not, you know, sort of packing in a bunch of, you know, sort of non-related um, applications to each other that could probably cause some, um, some failures. So really what I'm doing is kind of reducing some of the failure domain, um, some of the, sh the information sharing domain, isolating memory from each other, isolating virtual disk systems and whatnot. Again, probably getting a little bit more secure and again, raising the amount of utilization of these devices that we have. I'm your density. <laughs> okay, so um, then what came on? Cloud, right? Does anybody use the cloud here? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I use the cloud. It's, it's amazing, you know. So, <laughs> how quickly this came about. So, interesting side fact. I worked for this company, um, kind of like in the early cloud days. Uh, this is maybe 12 years ago or so, uh, maybe a little bit longer than that. But um, basically, the the concept of this company was to create a device that you put inside your network that collected all your data and then told you whether or not you should virtualize your systems. Now, virtualize your systems was the thing. At this time, Amazon AWS was already out and running. We were a generation of computing behind trying to produce services that were letting people to know whether they were just going to move their stuff to virtualization, and this thing came along, and that company is no longer there. Okay, so basically what the cloud is, we took those virtual machines and we stuck them in some, uh, somebody else's data center, and they take care of it for us, right? No longer the days of like racking and stacking and having cables and really giant messes inside of these, um, inside of these racks. Now somebody else does that for us. The racks like, would probably look amazing. Um, Azure had like a hockey floor. You could like slide things around and stuff like that. So, um, so cloud is really uh, sort of the next generation, the real um, sort of evolution of where we're at today. And this is a computing sort of atmosphere in which a lot of us are generating um, or at least working in today. And so we now we've got AWS, we've got Azure, we've got GCP, we've got all of Huawei. I don't even know what the European places are called, but um, all, all these public clouds are out there and proliferating and allowing us basically to move our compute resources out of our data centers and into these cloud areas. Okay, here's a quiz. What is this? What? What? Does anybody know what you? If you combine a C groups and a namespace together, what do you get? Yeah, yeah, you, uh, Docker. You get containers, okay. I knew somebody was gonna say Docker. We'll make funny a little bit. Containers are kind of the, uh, the overall thing. Docker is kind of like the, the Coca-Cola of the container world, right? Um, but yeah, there's Pepsi, there's all kinds of, you know, RC Cola, all the rest of those kind of things. Um, they're, all, they're all C groups plus namespaces. And so what a container allows us to do is, um, is pretty magical, right? So um, again, I come from a systems admin background. You know what it's like to like do all the dependencies? It, you know, does anybody work with like Java alternatives or like Python, like virtual EMVs and trying to put, pack all these things onto one system? It's an absolute nightmare, right? And so containers actually made this a lot easier for us because you could build all the dependencies of your application into one confined unit and it was a lot later, lighter weight than actually shipping virtual machines around, okay? So that, that the concept of being able to put something in a common container size and then being able to stack that onto some ship or something like that, uh, all of the, uh, the, the actual Docker icon um, is very, very powerful. It changed the way that we do computing and it's changed the way that we're doing things today. So now what happens, now we start getting back into sort of the virtualization paradigms, right? So now we're utilizing resources on a single, con on a single computer system by putting all these different containers that are either related or unrelated onto systems and allowing them to operate and basically sort of um, maximize the amount of compute um, that you're using on your systems, but also allowing you to make these things very portable and um, ability to run on any kind of platforms and be portable between them. And so now we've just kind of contained all these things together, right? We're using some kind of a virtualization platform. Uh, we're running containers on these things. Um, and now we're kind of like really learning how to pack and move our applications from place to place. I am your density, that's correct. Okay. So here's a quiz. If you take a, you know, some master node type of things that are out here, these are kind of controlling stuff. And then you put a bunch of containers on a bunch of other virtual hosts where the masters kind of make decisions as to where um, these applications go and where these containers go. What do you call this? What do you call it? Orchestration. Yeah, orchestration. Or no, you call it Nomad. <laughs> if you don't know this name, I highly encourage you to look it up because if you're in the early stages of going into containers or scheduling or anything along those lines, I'll save you a lot of trouble. This is a hell of a lot easier to use than Kubernetes is. And it's made by HashiCorp, so you know it's, uh, it's good software. Um, sort of kidding, but not really kidding. Actually, um, this is very, very important. Definitely, if you haven't heard of Nomad, take a look at it. It's an amazing platform. I'm your density, right? Okay, that's the last time I'm gonna do that. So basically, um, the, the, the concept of a scheduler is, is that um, the, you don't have a human being, you don't have a, a Jake Feinler or a Jake Lundberg out there trying to figure out what the resources are of your compute systems that are out there, and you're still able to maximize um, your compute power by putting, um, either doing some kind of bin packing, or you can do anti-affinity if you want to make sure that your applications are spread out between your nodes. Oh, I went the wrong way. 
And so it, I'm just kind of flipping back and forth, but it kind of looks like this, right? Your, your applications and your containers or non-containers in Nomad's case um, are kind of moving around and you know, we actually don't know where these services are gonna live at any particular time. Now, if you go back to the concept of what we we're talking about Jake Feinler updating these IP addresses by hand, you can see that there's a, a slight problem here. We have this concept of automation of being able to find out where these services are at, and that's where console comes in. Okay, so back to just kind of why we went over all the rest of the stuff that we're talking about here. We at HashiCorp and everybody else in the world realizes that the compute sort of atmosphere that we're working in is varied by nature. We still have people who are running things inside of data. Who's running things inside of a data center that they own right now? Still have a handful of people there. Anybody else have just like private clouds that aren't an actual um, sort of you know, public cloud? Okay, so we see that there's, you know, there's this kind of proliferation of this information. Not everybody has gone to the cloud even though they've been around for quite a bit of time. And now, not only is there just one cloud, there's like 10 or 15 or 20 different clouds that are out there um, in the public atmosphere that you could be running your information on. The next thing is that um, you're probably gonna be running on a variety of platforms. Um, I still have customers, especially in the banking industry, who have 70% or more of their compute is actually still done inside of mainframes. Now we've got bare metal systems that are out there. Um, if you see any of the work that like Jesse Frizzell and Brian Cantrell are doing on the oxide stuff, like they're literally going back into the um, sort of hardware um, side of things. Now we don't know if we're going to run stuff directly on their hardware, but that's a possibility now. And we have virtual machines and containers and serverless, of course. So really this kind of idea that the platform is getting very, very wide. And lastly is really this concept of like now we're getting to this multi-service world. So we still have monolithic applications. We're starting to go to microservices. Who knows what the next thing is? It's gonna be minor microliths or something like that. Um, so um, so the, the overall identity of this whole thing is that there's a tremendous amount of heterogeneity in the run, um, sort of the way that we run our applications. And so um, this is the only marketing-ish kind of slide that I have. So I'm um, sorry that I'm putting this in here, but I just, I like the way that this thing's laid out. So really, console has three main use cases. Um, the first is service registry and health monitoring. When my services come alive, let them automatically register themselves with consoles so that you get updated and automatic DNS names that you can route your services to. And then all you have to do is ship DNS names um, to any of the rest of your endpoints, and they automatically update these things on the way. The next is network middleware automation. This is a play that we've really been um, sort of focusing on because we know people have existing hardware devices um, that they're probably gonna be using for at least the next three to five years. How do I automatically update those things to understand what the topology of my networks and the topology, um, or basically the topology of my networks are? And then lastly, this really move into um, zero trust networking and service mesh, right? So um, does anybody use Istio out here? No, Istio or like Linkerd or, no, no, okay, good. So service mesh, um, still rather new on most people's lips, and we'll talk about some of those concepts here as we go along. Okay, so console is a simple and flexible architecture. Um, this is a typical architecture. Um, really, you're gonna have either three or five um, server uh, nodes within console. This helps with consistency and making sure that if one of our um, systems die, uh, we can fail over. If you're really curious, I highly encourage you to look up some of the RAF protocol um, uh, sort of uh, simulators and things like that are, that are out there. And the second side of it is um, you have a console client. So anything that's going to participate um, in your console clusters are basically gonna have a client or they're gonna be the servers. Again, three or five servers, everything else is a client. And so it kind of looks like this. You just have a bunch of devices out there um, on your networks um, in any of your clouds or any of your data centers. But the beauty of console is that it's not run platform dependent like any of the rest of the service discovery systems that are out there. Um, if you look at like a combination of like etcd or um, with core DNS inside of Kubernetes, that sort of serves some of the basic ser um, like uh, service discovery functions. But you can use console with you know, Kubernetes, you can use console with cloud instances, you can use it with bare metal devices, you can use it with Nomad. It doesn't matter, as long as you can get a console agent on the system, they can participate in service discovery. There are actually external service monitoring ways of, of, of adding in extra devices that are out there, but for the most part, this is the paradigm that generally holds true. Okay, so what does this look like? Right, so I've got two services that need to talk to each other. I've got a pet service where a cat service is probably a sub part of that. The cat service registers with the registry and console and basically says, I'm at you know, IP address 1.2.3.4 and I'm alive because of these rules and we'll see what those look like later. 
And as you start to get more cat services, they just register themselves with console. Now when the pet service needs to um, reach it, it basically says, hey, give me a cat instance out there that's alive and, and good to go, and I just return some kind of a value, one, two, three, six, okay? And then the pet service actually directly connects to the cat service. Now one of the things you may notice inside of this paradigm is that I'm not connecting through console, I'm just having console tell me where to go to find this particular service, and then I connect directly to that service on the end. If uh, a couple of these cat services hap happen to die, poor cats, you know, that happens sometimes, but uh, um, they actually get automatically removed from the system. And then when the pet service needs to um, consume the cat service, uh, it just, you know, queries that and it gets, again, a live endpoint that's there. This happens very, very rapidly, like milliseconds that this happens when we, when we realize that there's some kind of um, a problem in the system. Okay, so on the network middleware automation, this is very, very similar. Remember back to our load balancer operations. Um, now I've got this like cats.vip that the pet um, service needs to talk to. Uh, I've got a cats instance out there. Well, um, how, do I, how do I update these things? Well, in the traditional load balancer world, somebody's got to go into a load balancer when I add that server in there and then add this and the health rules and all the rest of that stuff that's in there. This is a very simplified uh, example of that, um, but there's some manual process to basically add these devices inside of this network. And so now that VIP has this 1.2.3.4, and I add some more services in there. I got to add those load balancer members into the, into the load balancer as I add them into the pool. And then now I have that capability of looking these things up as the pet service from those, um, from those VIP endpoints. If you add console into Mix, it's very, very similar to what we were doing for service discovery, except for instead of connecting directly, basically what we're doing is we're updating any of our network middleware, uh, our, our network devices, um, by having console um, have plugins that actually interact with your devices directly. So F5 has a, a plugin for this right now. We're developing a bunch of other ones as well. So basically as those new services um, come online, we add them automatically into console. Console updates your network devices and allows them to um, have a little bit more of a dynamic flow of updating these things. And again, if you remove those um, devices from the system, now you can actually automatically remove those um, from the load balancer. Obviously, if those health um, checks fail, um, you can uh, automatically fail or, or not include those inside of your balance members. This is slightly different about the addition and sort of subtraction of things inside of those load balancer pools. Okay, so the next uh, sort of discipline that we look at is this concept of zero trust networking and service mesh. And this is, this is really um, sort of based on a couple of things. The proliferation of microservices and the ability to actually figure out what the heck those microservices are doing. Um, so if you've been working with microservices for a while, observability is a massive problem. And so console as a service mesh um, is, uh, is quite an interesting solution. So if anybody um, heard the Istio 1.5 release um, that just happened earlier this week, one of the things that they talked about is that they actually took all those microservices and they compressed them into one binary. Well, what's that sound like? It sounds a lot like console. And I've been using console for six plus years now. It's a rock solid system. It's been there for a long time. Um, that model actually works. We have a single binary for the control plane, and the data plane is usually some kind of a pluggable um, uh, uh, proxy system that's on there. We have a certificate authority. I'll talk about why that's important next. There's a service access graph that gives us the um, sort of ability, like a firewall, of which endpoints can talk to each other. And lastly, the concept of how we actually integrate our applications, both at layer four and layer seven layers. The last, uh, second to last one down here is really interesting. I'll be showing this off during the demo. That's a concept of mesh gateways. It's kind of like a NAT for services in a service mesh. And then lastly, observability. Um, certainly not least, because the fact is like when you start um, decomposing all your systems, it's very hard to troubleshoot what's happening inside of those environments. Okay, so the control plane for this is the data plane. Another important factor about console is the way that it handles being a control plane. Console um, has a concept of, of locking mechanisms, it has um, watchers, it has all these um, ways of basically understanding when updates happen to the system, and it only propagates those updates when those updates occur. And this is extremely important when you think about something as a control plane, because the control plane should not have data or any kind of information going through it. It really should just control that data plane. And so what happens anytime we get a new set of rules, security rules, or any kind of routing rules, console will um, propagate those things out to the, the various proxy endpoints and then update them again only on the changes. 
Then the, ca the, the local agents cache those sh that, that um, set of instructions. And if we lose connectivity with the console servers, it doesn't really matter. We're still able to operate as we were on our last set of instructions. The only downside is maybe we just don't get um, any kind of an update, but that's better than actually having to interrogate every time something connects to the system. Okay. So the next uh, really interesting part about this is really on the security side. And this kind of um, talks about the concept of firewalls, this in, in, the, next, in the next concept. So we deploy an X5 on an end certificate um, out to any of our endpoints, and, it, and it's um, extended with the SPIFI protocol. So basically we're doing some kind of service identification inside of the certificates itself, and that, produ that provides its identity. And this is important in the next step. The other side of it is that also, because we have an X509 certificate, we get encryption for free, um, so to speak. You still have to process it, so you get processing power, um, but you also get this concept of, um, of encryption with this. And the beauty here is that we actually get automatic generation and rotation of the certificates. Have you ever managed X509 certificates or PKI certificates? I've done this for a while. It's not, a, it's not an easy task to do this right, and especially when it comes down to things like expirations. How many times have we seen something? I think Microsoft was probably the latest one. They shut down their, uh, their little chat network thing recently because of why? They had a certificate that expired. And so this concept of automatic um, rotation and generation is very important. The other thing that's really interesting about this is that if you lower the TTLs for your certificates, and your certificates somehow get leaked out into the internet somewhere, um, if you're doing constant rotation of these things, somebody has an old certificate, so what? We've rotated that thing out, now they can't get inside of our data path and, and, um, and decrypt this data. And this is where um, the, uh, the certificate identification comes in really handy, is this concept of a service access graph. So if you look back at the load balancer, or not, either the load balancer or the firewall rules that we had before, remember every time we add an endpoint into the firewall, two services that need to talk to each other through a firewall or IP tables rule or any you of know, the rest of these kind of technologies, you have to update some table somewhere that basically tells you that these endpoints are allowed to talk to each other. One of the powerful concepts about consoles of service mesh is that you use service names to delineate actually which services can talk to each other. So in this particular case, we're denying all traffic to web, and then we're allowing web to talk to DB. Well, what if there's 10 web servers? That's cool. 10 web servers, as long as they have a certificate that identifies them as web, they're allowed to talk to the database. What if I have 100 web servers, or 1,000 web servers, or a million web servers for that matter? I can, I can control the connections between a million endpoints with this single rule, as long as they're all the same um, sort of service endpoints. And so really the beauty here is that we allow ourselves some scale independence and we only define the rules between the things that talk to each other, right? And your applications, when you're composing them, you typically know which other applications that they're talking to. And so during the process of actually creating and, and sort of um, hooking your applications together, you as a development team in a DevOps world can actually define these things and very, very easily roll them out to the people who are administering the systems. In fact, in most cases, you don't even have to do this. Um, there's a really rich ACL system system within console that basically allows people with certain domain information to update the services that they are allowed to talk to um, and, all, and at the same time allow you to prove those things in there. Uh, I don't have the ACL examples inside of here, I'm a little bit of an advanced use case for console. Okay, whoa, what happened? Ooh, that was interesting. I got some weird, uh, um, some transitions in here. Okay, so, whoa, uh -oh, uh -oh, uh -oh. what did I do? Yep, sorry, the... Uh, the locks are, are getting in the way over here. Okay, so how do I actually uh, sort of integrate uh, my applications to use this? Again, relatively easy. You just have to have a console agent. If it's, uh, you know, sort of uh, um, bare metal or um, virtual machines, just a console agent here. If it's Kubernetes or Nomad, um, each of the worker nodes in your environment will have a, um, will have a console agent. If you're using Kubernetes, um, there's Helm charts that are out there. If you're using Nomad, we have some automatic ways of doing that as well. So basically, uh, a service that needs to uh, register itself that says, hey, I'm service A or web or whatever, um, I need a proxy. And in order to create the proxy, there's a couple different ways. If you don't have a scheduling platform that has automated um, launching, you're gonna do this. Basically, there's one command line uh, sort of invocation for creating this. If you're inside of Nomad, it's as easy as sort of this one liner that's on three lines right here. You just say, hey, I need a sidecar service for connect. And if you're in Kubernetes, you just do an annotation that basically says, you know, do an, an auto injection of these um, of these uh, sidecar um, services. Again, very very simple. Once consoles in your system to be able to integrate this with your applications. 
So now I have a, uh, a proxy that's defined, and then my application talks to the proxy for any of the endpoints that it needs to talk to on its distant end. If I need other applications to talk to each other, the same thing happens on the upstream, right? Um, we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to register um, with console, and now I'm going to get secure traffic that's authenticated um, and only uh, or authenticated traffic between these various endpoints based off of the rule sets that we created in the service access graph that we had before. And these are pluggable, so um, very, very likely most people, because they want the layer seven metrics and all that, um, they're probably going to use Envoy. Um, we decided not to build our own layer seven uh, proxy because Lyft already did that for us. Thanks, Lyft. All right, cool. Um, so uh, this is pretty close to the end here. Service routing, in terms of lecture, I've got a demo. How am I doing? I'm a little short on time, but um, so service routing is is also very interesting here. Like, how do I actually get data to um, you know or, or do traffic shaping within my application environment? And uh, console breaks this up into sort of three um, areas here. One's called HTTP routing. The next one's called traffic splitting, and the last one's called custom resolution. So um, a service router looks something like this. Remember back to the um, proxy example that we had with like Nginx or HTTP? I basically take some kind of a path prefix out here and I'm going to tie it to a particular service. So um, if you remember the other thing before, I was probably doing some kind of routing to the endpoints by you know, telling it where to send the data on a proxy. Now I'm actually automatically registering my service endpoints with console. And so now I can just give it a path, uh, you know, this path prefix, and any destination service that matches this cat um, endpoint is going to get traffic sent to it. The next of this is traffic splitting. So if you're doing like blue-green deployments or some kind of canaries or something along those lines, um, here we're just doing a 50-50 traffic split between various endpoints. And I'm, I'm tagging these with these subset identifiers, and this will make more sense in, the, in, the, in sort of the next level, is that now I've got these V1 and V2 that are going to get 50% of my traffic, and now I'm going to do some resolution. And so the resolution allows you to take any kind of custom data that you want to put inside of your registration for, your, um, for any of your console services and then tie them to some, um, some tag name right here, right? So I'm going to take this service.meta.version for one and two. I'm going to tag them with these um, sort of subset information things. And now when I decide that I want to go to cats, um, it's going to automatically route or do a coin flip and figure out which of these endpoints that you want to send this data to. I think the last slide still had everything on here. So it's kind of like a reduction of where I'm going to send this data to for any of these routing decisions that I have here. So extremely flexible. You can use all or none of these endpoints. You can still just send everything to the CATS endpoint. But again, if you want to do sort of custom traffic shaping, um, you can do that with, uh, with this technology that's here. And sort of the last technology piece, I'm actually going to go through this. I'm not going to talk through these slides. Here's a you know, sort of a singular service that's talking on an RFC 1918 address right here, right? So I've got an API server that's talking to the DB. Um, the web server doesn't have an intention to allow it to talk to the database. And so an IP-based um, sort of rule set would probably allow that web server to talk to the DB. Now that we have things that are identity-based, I'm only going to allow identity-based services to talk to my various endpoints that are there. What happens when I need to route data between RFC 1918 addresses? Our answer to this is called a mesh gateway. Um, without this, you probably need something like an API gateway. You need some ingress and egress um, technologies. What we've actually done is we've created another um, sort of extension to the Envoy proxies about basically making them console aware of console service names across your environments. And so really, if I want to talk to DB, all I have to do is say, you know, give me a DB. I don't care if it's in data center A or B or halfway across the world or wherever it is. Just the fact that I have the console service name allows me to automatically route the data through anything that participates in these mesh gateways. And this is, again, very, very powerful because you don't need API gateways. You don't need um, extra sort of routing rules that are there. Console basically knows where all of its mesh gateways are within the world, and it'll automatically send the distant endpoint to an alive service somewhere inside of your environment, depending on how to how you set this up. I'll show this inside the demo. Okay, um, it, configuring a mesh gateway, again, it's pretty easy. You can see um, sort of uh, halfway down here, I just have this single um, line that's coming into this thing and says, give me a mesh gateway. Super, super simple to, um, to enable on your systems. And we have the same analogs for, again, Nomad and, and uh, Kubernetes. An important thing to realize here is that the mesh gateways are unaware of the traffic that's inside of them. We use SNI headers to figure out where those service endpoints are at, and then everything else, all of your encrypted data is still encrypted in your payloads. We don't have to decrypt that data to figure out where to send it. And intentions, those service access grants,
aircraft is, is in force across your data center. And lastly, I'm going to talk about just observability. Clearly, now that we're decomposing things in the microservices, or even if you're using a monolithic service, um, but we're using this technology, uh, we need to be able to figure out what's happening when things go wrong, or if we just want to see the kind of data that's out there. So we, um, we integrate with StatsD, Datadog, Prometheus, and we connect both, or we collect both layer four and layer seven metrics. And so you get a very rich understanding of what's happening inside of your environments. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna run a demo. How am I doing on time? I've got uh, about 20 minutes. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna be a little tight here. So um, we're using Instruct. I'm gonna go through kind of the concept of doing a legacy registration. Um, we're gonna do some Kubernetes registration. Um, do the service mesh setup, mesh gateways, and the mesh gateway failover. Um, I'm gonna launch this thing. It's gonna take a few minutes to do this. So while um, while this thing is is starting up. Um, I'm going to go back and kind of run through what this looks like inside of here. So um, I'm actually using Instruct. Does everybody know what Instruct is uh, for a platform? Have you heard of this before? So it's kind of like a Kata coder or something along those lines. Um, and what happens actually is that Instruct will actually launch cloud resources for you on the fly. And so um, we as HashiCorp have really started um, using this for demo environments because um, while we have uh, products like Terraform and you know, console, of course, to launch infrastructure as we want on the fly, one of the problems we typically have is around discipline, right? What do people do? They launch cloud resources, they leave them running, you forget to turn them off. Well, with something like Instruct, I can actually launch all of this, this environment on the, on the way, and as soon as I'm done with it, just hit the stop button and everything goes away. If I forget that stop button, it'll automatically delete itself from the system. So, um, so very, very powerful for things like Learn Platforms, and for us, um, something that we're moving to um, for our demo environment. So, um, so you know, again, forgive me, uh, there's, a, there's some rough edges <laughs> around here uh, that I ran into earlier, um, but uh, we'll, we'll make it through it. I'm, I'm giving her a go. While the thing is booting up, let me uh, let me just kind of run you through what this what this uh, what this demo is going to do. Uh, so so the first uh, so the first piece of it is that we're just going to connect to um, disparate um, data centers together um, using Console's WAN join capabilities. The second thing is we're going to launch just a what we call a legacy app. It's just a, ba a bare Docker app that's not in Kubernetes or Nomad. And then uh, we're going to launch a payments app, which automatically injects a um, Envoy proxy inside of a Kubernetes cluster. <coughs> Next thing is we're going to add a, we're going to by hand, we're going to add an Envoy um, proxy to the currency service in the second da data center. And then we're going to start adding the mesh gateways in. Okay. At this time, we're going to try to start routing data, but um, until we actually um, sort of mesh these things in together, we won't be able to get data. And then, uh, of course, we'll be able to route the data through the mesh gateways. Second thing we're going to do is we're going to stand up a local currency service inside of the Kubernetes cluster. And then lastly, we're going to show what a failover scenario looks like, right? So if I'm just running everything and I want to run everything in my local data center, but my local service fails and then automatically routes the data to the distant end um, using, the, uh, using the mesh gateways. Okay, that's that. Hopefully my demo is ready to go. Hey, hey look at that, start. Okay, um, so look at my data centers. Well, I'm um, sorry for this. I'm going to have to switch back and forth between um, these various endpoints. Kind of cool is like uh, this thing allows me to uh, sort of um, select this data, and this is pretty easy. I'm just going to um, join my WAN servers together. Um, I can see, let's see, my console thing. Sorry, this uh, the screen's a little bit low, so it's hard to see that. So now um, you should see, hopefully, I get some conversions here between my data centers. I've got DC1, I've got DC2. I'm going to come down to here. Uh, yeah, sorry for the uh, format here, this uh, low resolution. Can you guys read this okay? Okay, cool. All right, so um, you can see just, you know, I've got this kind of WAN join between uh, my environments, and then I'm going to go and check this thing. Um, so kind of a ne another cool thing about Instruct is that when you're setting this up for student challenges, um, you can actually check to make sure that the students have done what they were supposed to do. So if I didn't console WAN join right there, it would have checked to make sure that um, I actually had these things joined together and would have told me if it, um, if it didn't work. Um, if you go to our Instruct track, you can actually see um, a bunch of other cool stuff that we've got going on here. So let's see what I've got. I've got console members. Um, oh, hey, look at this thing. I've got, uh, let's see, my data center, sorry. Uh, you can see that I can both check my, my um, primary data center as well as my secondary data center inside of this thing. And what am I going to do? Sorry. How do I do this? Okay, so if I go console members, what do I have? I've got a currency service that's running in DC2. You can see I've got, oh, that's not an actual command, is it? 
So I, I, I just have this currency service that's working inside of my local environment. Uh, what else am I? Oh, I'm going to actually do this registration here. So um, this is just kind of a, a basic console registration um, that we have here. You can see it's doing the health check um, to register this um, particular currency service. And if we look inside of the uh, inside of the UI in my services, you can see I just have this like console service that's here. I'm going to register the service if I can click this thing and reload my console. And we should see inside of this interface, assuming I can get this thing to work, um, that will get, where's my service at? Hi there. Am I in the right place? Yeah, currency production, and I don't see any services. Hi. Oh, I'm in the wrong data center. That helps. Okay, cool. All right, so you can see automatically that uh, once I've um, registered in a live data or currency service, it's going to come back to the service endpoint. And now, um, if I want to, I can uh, I can kind of look at this. Uh, oh, this is this is harder to do. Sorry, this is much lar easier to do on a very large screen. Okay, so anyways, I'm just going to query my my currency service and get some in data from it. Okay. And on to the next thing. Okay, so um, now that we have that in the, in the sort of the distant data center that I had on there, I'm going to um, then set up my Kubernetes service. I'll say that was the kind of legacy way of doing things. I'm automatically registering services within console. Um, now we'll see what it's kind of like to use the easy button, just running a Kubernetes service that has um, that data um, already installed inside of it. How am I doing? I got 13 minutes. Okay, I think I, I can make this happen, guys. All right. Um, so cool. Uh, if we look inside of this app config inside of here, uh, let's say, and we look inside of payments, uh, what's important to realize is I've got these upstream um, sort of endpoints that is actually explicitly telling this thing where to get its data on the distant end. And this is going to come in important later when we look at how these things are configured. But you can see I'm, I'm, I'm sort of defining this currency service in dc2.console, okay? So one of the other powerful things about console is that be, um, console is aware of data centers that are out there. So if you, if you explicitly want to send data to a distant endpoint, you can actually do that. And then you can see I've got this um, sort of uh, injector that I have in here um, as well. So let's come back. I'm going to apply this thing, and this is just a normal sort of Kubernetes um, creation. I've got a 30 second sleep period inside of here. So, so again, um, the other part of this is that um, console has kind of a helper um, that does bi-directional syncs between Kubernetes services and console services. And so um, depending on how your applications are developed, you can use either one of those um, technologies, right? So if you have things that aren't going to consume console directly, you can just use the Kubernetes service names. Um, however, if you have services that are going to use console, and this is important, Remember, I don't have to just talk to services that are within Kubernetes. Once they're inside of this sort of console service mesh area, I get the benefits of basically being able to mesh in non-Kubernetes services and any kind of services for that matter. So it could be on bare metal, it could be on a, on a VM somewhere, or it could be a Nomad. Very, very powerful um, techniques. So if I come over to my service window, you can see all these things that have been created. You can see I've created payments and I've created the sidecar proxies automatically, all because of the way that these application um, configs are defined. And again, inside of here, I just have these injectors um, that have these console connect things. So um, there's upstream definitions as well. So if I know for sure I'm, I'm consuming services from other, uh, from other areas, I can then define those inside of my annotations for Kubernetes. All right. Uh, let's see, do I need anything else? Oh, right. No, it's a, it's a company out of, uh, out of the Netherlands. Um, so one of our developer advocates used to work there. He actually created this platform. And then when he came here, he said, hey, we got this thing called Instruct. You guys should check this out. Um, if you go to instruct.com um, slash HashiCorp, um, you can actually see we have a whole bunch of different things. So we have Vault. We've got Terraform. Uh, we've got um, Console. We've got Nomad. So all of our major products you can go to and do learn platforms on here. And they're really interesting because um, a lot of these are developed by our solutions engineers. And so, um, and so basically what you'll find is that all of our f operational and field experience is kind of poured into these examples that we've created for these things. And so, um, so this is just kind of a troubleshooting exercise. Do I even have to do this? I don't have to do this. I'm going to skip by this, sorry. So, um, and again, um, so uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a couple of little rough edges around here. Again, we, we created this for, um, for a slightly different purpose. I've, I've repurposed this thing inside of here. So, 
So now what I'm going to do um, inside of my distant end service is I'm going to update that um, I'm going to update that Docker container in the DC2, and you can see here I'm just going to add in this definition for a sidecar service here. So I'm going to I'm going to put this here. Does that actually do that? Wow, that was interesting. Okay, that's cool. And reload this thing, and then I think I've got um, another set of commands that I have here. Okay, so remember um, if I'm running outside of a scheduling platform like Nomad or Kubernetes. I have to explicitly tell that proxy server to run. Again, um, this is, it's a one-liner that's in here, um, but you have to be able to do this in order to get the proxy up and running. Actually, let's see what this looks like. So if I'm in DC, whoa, where am I at? I've got a currency, I think I'm in the other data center. Oh no. Oh, I, I, created a, I created the definition for it. I didn't actually launch it. Okay, so, uh, so anyways, I have, to, I have to actually launch this thing um, and now I've got um, what amounts to this, uh, side, this sidecar proxy in DC2 that's up and running here, and, and now I can basically hook these, um, these services up to each other. Let's see, add the legacy sidecar. I think I did that, that's what I did. Yeah, sorry, the screen resolution is really throwing me off, guys. <laughs> so. So now the idea is now I've got, I've got these proxy endpoints. I've got my services with these um, Envoy proxies across these various data centers. The problem is if it, I don't really have routes to get the data to them, right? Because they're in these desperate data centers. I don't have a way, unless I expose these, um, these endpoints somewhere out in the internet, I need to be able to hook these things up. And so I'm going to kind of skip through some of these. Well, if I look at these, um, like some of this data like here, um, if I'm just looking at some Nmap data, um, you can see that my kind of local service is, is able to talk to this um, to this gateway that I have running. And then if I want to actually run um, the mesh gateway, again, I can't automatically register things in sort of these um, legacy environments. I'm going to find the IP address for the host that I'm on, and then I'm going to actually run um, the mesh gateway. And again, remember, there's some manual processing for um, so, sort of these old legacy services that are here. But now basically I've launched this gateway. And again, think of it kind of like a NAT gateway that I put um, on the edge of my network. And if I come back over here and I look at nodes, um, you'll see that I actually have um, four nodes, or three nodes in here. I have my console server, um, I've got a currency node, and I have a gateway node. Okay, so when I launch this gateway proxy service, it shows up inside of console as being sort of its own uh, gateway node. And I'm not gonna, I could look at that listener, that doesn't really matter. We're just going to get through this. I'm short on time for that. I got seven minutes. Whoa. Cool. All right, so now that I have the gateway in DC2, I'm going to um, launch up the other gateway inside of DC1. And this thing's taking a sec. Hold on. I'll grab some water. So the only trick with Instruct is that during a demo, you never know how fast this thing's going to run. Okay, so this is actually just kind of in, in interrogating the, the particular endpoints that we have. Um, it's not like super, super interesting. Um, you can go back through here and probably take a look at these later. And if I do a switch to this thing, basically I'm going to launch that gateway in my secondary um, sort of environment. Now, there are different ways of doing this. You can actually launch these gateways inside of Kubernetes itself. It's probably best that you launch it outside of there. Um, that way you have a choice of both meshing in um, local Kubernetes servers as, as well as any of your um, sort of external services as well. And I think that's all I'm doing. If I look inside this, I'll show you what this looks like. Uh, if I actually run, if I click in here, uh, you can actually see this listener is going to this particular IP address. Maybe not super, super interesting. Probably more interesting is the actual Envoy configs when we get to those. Okay. And so now that, now that I have my mesh gateways up and running, I'm actually going to redeploy my set of applications in DC1. Um, so I'm going to go back, redeploy these applications inside of here, and make them sort of aware <coughs> that the mesh gateways are even part of this information. And sorry, this, uh, whoops. That's not what I want. I want to see if I can actually get to, oh, I don't know how I do this. That's Jaeger. Uh, oh, gosh. Sorry, I'm trying to see if I can, if I can show you this. Uh, that's not what I want. Um, this is a little bit, that's a little bit big. 
Um, but this, uh, this particular definition, if you remember how that thing was set up, I had these upstream URIs down here that were set up specifically for that particular endpoint. Now, because I've launched this, um, this local, um, I've launched this local proxy, I'm actually, taking, I'm actually taking the definition of that local proxy and just moving it into the annotation up here and basically um, explicitly defining this thing to move um, the data um, from my local uh, data center into this um, DC2 data center. So it's actually explicitly telling it which console server um, that it's going to um, connect up to. And sorry, this is a little bit small, um, but... A little. So, you know, the, the truth is basically what we're doing is running a kubectl and, and applying that new set of rules um, for that particular endpoint. And I think that's everything that's good inside of there. Uh, and then we'll, we, can, we can look at what the trace data looks like here in a little bit. But basically, um, what the trace data is, is inside of here is really just looking at um, whether or not that data is actually um, being uh, encrypted or not. Um, I'm going to kind of skip past this stuff right now. Just to see, is that going to work? Yay. All right, perfect. And we've got just a couple minutes. Don't worry, um, I'll stick around for questions afterwards if you guys want to ask me stuff. I know we're a little bit tight on time. Okay, so the last, the last piece of this, uh, let's see if I can get this a little easier to read. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to redeploy this thing once again. And where's my app server? Um, so this one's a little bit different. And so if you remember back to the previous example, the way that we had hooked up these services between the endpoints was to basically allow them to explicitly um, find data across um, explicit uh, console endpoints, right? So there's a major difference in the way that this annotation is set up inside of here. This particular annotation is basically saying, find some kind of a currency service, be it alive um, locally or somewhere else, and allow me to route data um, to that particular endpoint. And so, uh, and so what we're going to do inside of here, we'll do this, uh, we'll do this application of this thing. And then I'm actually just going to look at um, the data that's coming um, in here that you have. Okay, so, um, so basically I'm querying the, the front end for these things. It's routing data through this particular data center um, and getting these things locally. And I think that, uh, let's see. This one's going to DC1, this one's going to DC2. You can see um, I'm routing this data through the endpoint here. Um, maybe not super clear again, sorry, I'm, um, I'm going a little bit fast here. But um, the next thing that I'm actually going to do is that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to register a set of rules um, that allows me to uh, basically um, create this failover domain. And so if you notice the, the, the text of this, it's maybe hard to read inside of here, but Really all I'm saying is inside of this middle block here is for my failover, allow any services, I just lost my mic, sorry guys, um, allow any services that fail to automatically fail over to um, the distant end data server. And this is extremely powerful because this is literally your entire failover domain for every single service that you have can be controlled with one rule. As long as your applications are, are participating in this console cluster, they're able to basically fail this data over between any of your endpoints. Okay, so uh, if I look at this, uh, this thing here, oops, I think I just showed this to you guys. Um, so basically, again, I'm just looking directly at this currency service. I'm not telling it to go to any of these particular data centers. And then this thing is a very long way Of basically looking at the um, looking at the uh, the envoy data that's coming out of here. I think what's important to look at inside of here is really this, these SNI headers. So I'm doing a query against the application, trying to figure out where it's actually going to send the data. And currently, um, the envoy proxy is basically saying there's an alive service that I have here. Send this data to DC1. So if I were to come down here um, and then look at this guy, I think this is just my local, um, this is my local uh, instance. So I'm actually querying this currency service. This is just to show you that that particular currency um, service is alive, um, that I'm actually routing data to it. And now I'm actually going to go in, I'm going to delete the currency service from data center one, right? So if I, if I look in, I think this is inside of here, um, DC1 has this like currency service that's, that's, uh, that's defined inside of here. Um, DC2 also has a currency service that's defined inside of it. 
And so I'm just going to come back to the command line. I'm going to delete the currency service from DC1. And you can see, if we come down here, I don't have a currency service inside of, um, inside of DC1 anymore. And then let's route the data to that endpoint, right? So we're going to run the same query of um, looking at the, uh, at the, the Kubernetes data and then looking at the, um, oh gosh, this thing. And then actually looking directly at the Envoy proxy itself. Well, if you look inside the Envoy proxy, um, you can actually see that the definition for this thing is switched from DC1 to DC2 automatically. So my service has actually failed, um, but my endpoints, um, if I were to look at the you know, sort of local host endpoint that I have, and this is just querying my, my web server that's hooked up um, to these particular services, if I were to query this endpoint, I'm still getting access to that particular currency endpoint that's there, all through the fact that I have A, one basic service definition for the currency service itself, and B, I have this concept of the mesh failover through the mesh gateways. And so the, the, basically the Envoy proxies are smart enough to know, and, and a combination of that and console, that if a particular service fails, it knows that it can route that data to any of the distant endpoints, and it, and it updates those proxies automatically. And remember, back to that concept of what I was talking about before, is the fact that once console realizes that there's a change in its architecture, it automatically propagates those out to any of the agents reconfigures those Envoy proxies on the fly and basically allows you to automatically route traffic in between any of your console endpoints that participate in these mesh gateways. Okay, and I think that um, that's kind of the end of it. Again, um, I think, you know, sort of the easiest thing um, to do, I've completed the track, yay, I'm gonna stop this thing, and then um, just kind of go back to um, sort of this overall um, picture of what it was that we did, right? So, um, so again, We've, we've hooked these things up um, for some kind of WAN connectivity between our various console data centers. We've added a um, sort of a legacy service inside of here. We've added a Kubernetes service and automatically injected a um, Envoy proxy for that particular service. Um, we've added a Envoy proxy to the, um, to, the, to the legacy service and then added a couple of mesh gateways to allow traffic to basically be routed um, through these mesh gateways without having to do any kind of other routing rules outside of it. And lastly, and we demonstrated what it looks like to use one service definition just for the currency service itself. It automatically connect data to the local data center, and if that thing fails, then route that data to the distant end data service. Okay. So cool. Um, we're hiring. If uh, you're looking for a job at one of the coolest uh, companies, uh, that at least the best company I have ever worked for, um, absolutely come up and talk to me. Or if not, you don't want to talk to me because your boss is here, um, you can go to hashicorp.com.jobs or slash jobs. Uh, there's a proxy involved in this thing right here. See this little thing? That's how proxies at work. Okay, so thank you. Um, I'm Jake Lundberg, and this is Council Service Network.